All right, first on the agenda, we have uh, House File 1653. Welcome, Representative Coulter. Would you like to move your uh, House File? I would love to move my House File. Okay. Uh, Representative uh, Coulter moves that House File 1653 be laid over for possible inclusion into the Property Tax Division Report. Uh, please uh, describe your bill. Uh, there is an amendment. Would you like to present your bill or would you like to do the amendment first? Uh, why don't we do the amendment first? Just get okay. it out of the way here. Would you like to describe your amendment? Yeah, so this, uh, this is, I can, I can move the A1 amendment and this is uh, purely a technical amendment. This just updates the numbers in the bill um, to reflect the most recent budget forecast. Uh, this is my understanding. This is something that's traditionally done shortly after uh, uh, February forecasts and much like Fiddler on the Roof, we're opening with tradition. Okay, is there any uh, questions, comments regarding the bill? If not, uh, um, Representative Coulter moves uh, the amendment and it is approved. Are all in favor? Aye. Uh, aye. Opposed, motion carried. I forgot to say aye too, so don't feel bad. All right, uh, Representative Coulter, please uh, present your bill as amended. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so first of all, I want to um, thank my co-authors, some of whom are, or at least one of whom is in this room, uh, Chair Gomez. Um, and I also want to thank now Commissioner Marquardt. This bill um, was uh, part of a, a package uh, that he originally carried last year and was actually included in uh, the tax bill agreement last year as well. So we spent a lot of time in this committee talking about, <clears throat> excuse me, how the need for local governments to continue providing services has really taken a pretty significant toll on residential property taxpayers. Um, and also obviously the tools that we have at our disposal to address that. Um, and we also know obviously that housing prices are through the roof, um, which combined sort of with the economic challenges that resulted uh, from the need to address the pandemic have had extremely disparate uh, impacts on residential properties. And I actually uh, pulled up the assessment report from my hometown, from the city of Bloomington. Um, and from 2021 to 2022, commercial properties in Bloomington saw a 7% value increase. Single family residential uh, saw a 17% increase and apartments saw a 22% increase. And that really is sort of the genesis of why um, I am bringing forward House File 1653 uh, because as we sort of think about the impact of property taxes and particularly the impact on those who can least afford it, renters really have been among the hardest hit. Obviously enter the renter's credit. And I know all of you know this already, but the renter's credit basically works to refund a certain percentage of income assumed to be paid in property taxes to renters. As incomes get higher, the maximum refund decreases the percentage of, and the percentage of income and uh, the copay increase. In 2020, around 305,000 Minnesotans received an average renter's credit refund of about $700. The challenge, of course, is that renters don't pay property taxes the same way that homeowners do. And I actually had to <laughs> confirm this because it's been a few years since I've been a renter, uh, but renters don't get truth and taxation notices in the mail reminding them to fill out their M1PR or you know, to go to their, their local truth and taxation hearing. Um, so we know that a lot of renters, folks who are entitled to be getting money back in their pockets, aren't. Um, and in fact, another sort of anecdote here, I was talking about this bill with my wife, who obviously was terribly interested in it. Um, and she's you know, an educated person, and I can assure you, very careful about spending. Um, and she mentioned that in the seven or so years that she was a renter, she remembered getting applying for the renter's credit maybe once or twice. So House File 1653 would convert the renter's credit from a state paid property tax refund into an income tax credit. This would mean that renters wouldn't need to fill out another form and depending on how the department structures it, may not even need to put a different another line item on their income tax return. In other words, this would basically make it automatic. And the result would be that approximately 119,000 renters, people who don't, who, excuse me, people who do qualify, who qualify but don't currently apply, would get money back in their pockets. And the other substantial piece of House File 1653 is that it also um, 
changes the definition of income to uh, the federal definition of adjusted gross income uh, with the effect of that being that an additional 33,000 renters who don't currently qualify would. Um, so th those of you who can do the math know that that's an appro approximately 100 uh, 152,000 renters who would now be getting this additional credit. Uh, you should have a, a handout in your packet detailing who currently receives the renter's credit, uh, but I think it is worth pointing out a little bit, <clears throat> excuse me, about who they are. More than 60% have incomes below $40,000 annually, and around 30% are seniors and or folks with disabilities. And I did the math, in 53 counties, that number is higher than 40%. And in 18 counties, that number is higher than 50%. And these are just the folks actually getting the credit now. I don't obviously have the numbers in front of me, but I think it's fair to say that the folks who aren't but could are far more likely to have lower incomes, be seniors and or folks with disabilities and people of color. So I say all of this because, you know, as we're, we're thinking about the changes that we would like to see made to tax policy this year, if we agree that property tax burdens are significant, and I think we do, and that our focus should be putting money in the pockets of folks who need it most, and again, I think we agree on that, this change would get directly at both of those, both of those goals in a way that would help a lot of people. Uh, so with that, I'm happy to uh, turn it over to my testifiers. I wanna introduce the first one uh, because he is a constituent of mine. He's a renter in Bloomington, and I, uh, his name is Brendan Klein. And I asked Brendan to speak because I, I think it really is important for us to ground ourselves in the reality of what this would mean for the folks directly impacted, for renters, uh, before we, we get too deep into the policy side. Well, thank you, uh, Mr. Klein. If you could come down, state your name for the record, and proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, my name is Brendan Klein, as stated previously by Representative Coulter. I also thank the committee for allowing me to testify today. Uh, as the agenda states, my illustrious qualification is that I'm a renter. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll do my best to explain what that's like. <laughs> um, I'm speaking in support of the legislation before you today, House File 1653, since, as stated previously, it will increase constituent awareness and, as a result, access to the existing rental credit policy. Uh, my hope is to share what that experience and that impact look like for rent renters like myself. Uh, according to Zumper, an organization that analyzes rent trends across large metropolitan areas, the average rent for a one bed, one bath apartment right here in St. Paul is $1,288 a month. This data shows to be about an 18% increase just within this last year. Now, in order for an individual to rent in St. Paul and keep rent payments below the recommended 30% of gross income, they would have to earn an annual gross income of $51,520. Yet, the Minnesota Housing Partnership shows that the median income of Minnesota renters is $41,414. I share this to say that, simply put, renters' budgets are being stretched thinner and thinner, which is what the renter credit policy is meant to address. Providing a credit to renters allows more people to have stable shelter, and allocate income to other budgetary needs, such as saving for retirement, a home, college, and the other daily needs that life demands. To put it into context, the $700 rent credit would be two months worth of groceries for one individual, or three months of gas for a car. Things that all Minnesotan renters would willingly put money towards if they knew how to access the renter's credit. The problem is that the additional paperwork required to apply for the renter's credit often goes unfilled due to the lack of awareness. So the opportunity and challenge brought to the committee is this. If this credit is known to have direct benefits to renters, why make it more difficult for them to access this credit? The language in this legislation will make it easier for renters to become aware of this credit and apply for it. The more we can simplify and streamline our complicated tax system, the better. I'll end my testimony by thanking the chair, the members of the committee for their attention and I ask that you pass this legislation to help simplify our tax system and make renting more affordable for the average Minnesotan by increasing awareness of this credit. Thank you. Well, thank you, uh, Mr. Klein. Next up, we have uh, Nan Madden. Please come down, state your name for the record, and proceed with your testimony.
Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. Uh, my name is Nan Madden. I'm director of the Minnesota Budget Project. Thank you so much for the opportunity to testify today in support of this exciting bill, and I want to thank Representative Coulter for bringing it forward. As you've heard, this bill represents the game-changing renter's credit proposal brought forward by the House last year and included in the 2022 tax agreement, but not yet enacted into law. Uh, you've heard from uh, Mr. Klein this morning and also about two weeks ago, uh, you heard from Michael Dahl from Homeline about the difference that the renter's credit makes for folks struggling to afford the basics of daily living and keep up with the rising costs of rent. And you have also uh, our issue brief on the importance of the renter's credit in every part of the state. And just to uh, reiterate, more than 300,000 Minnesota households currently receive the credit. And in greater Minnesota, the credit especially is an important financial lifeline for seniors and people with disabilities. Through income targeted property tax refunds, the state helps bring down one of the costs of housing and creates a more equitable tax system by refunding a portion of the property taxes that uh, qualifying renters have paid through their rents. It's not only a financial boost to the Minnesotans who receive it, but also a multiplier effect through their local communities when renters spend their refunds on rent, groceries, or other basics. Uh, just to uh, reiterate again, the proposal makes two important changes. First, changing the income definition used to qualify for and calculate the renter's credit changing from the complex uh, household uh, income measure to the more common adjusted gross income, and then converting the renter's credit into a refundable tax credit that people would file for as part of, part of the income tax system uh, instead of the separate application process later in the year. The high impact result of this uh, bill would um, come from both of those changes. So by putting it on the income tax form, nearly 120,000 Minnesota households are expected to begin reading, receiving the credit. These are folks who already qualify but are facing barriers to uh, navigating the process and the dollars would get into renters' pockets sooner. By changing to adjusted gross income, like many other provisions of our tax code, it'll be simpler for Minnesotans to apply for and for the department to administer. About half of the currently eligible households would qualify for larger refunds than they do now an additional 33,000 would become <coughs> eligible. All of these uh, game-changing outcomes would occur while still maintaining the important sliding scale structure of the renter's credit that prioritizes the lowest income Minnesotans and the <coughs> folks who are struggling the most uh, to, to make ends meet. And because there's a one-time cost in the first year it goes into effect to make this transition, this is a good use for some of the one-time dollars that are a part of the 24-25 budget surplus. Um, we're very excited about, our, about this proposal. Many of our community partners are as well. We also look forward to uh, talking with the bill author, talking with the committee more about potential outreach and education efforts that might uh, go along with this change uh, to minimize any unintended negative consequences on Minnesota renters um, who are used to receiving, uh, or used to applying and receiving these resources in the fall. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, finally, we have Mr. Uh, Valenzuela. You could come down to the podium, state your name for the record, and proceed. Good morning. I'm Alejandro Valenzuela. Um, chair and members of the committee, thank you for having me here today, this morning. I'm um, here to support the House File uh, 1653. My name is Alejandro Valenzuela. I'm a tax financial services director at Prepare and Prosper, um, working for the lo um, Volunteer Income Tax Assistance Program. Um, I've worked with our organization for the uh, past four tax seasons. I'm going and we're in the middle of the fifth season right now, so it's pretty busy. Um, over that time, I have had the honor to work with thousands of um, low-income families, um, and that you know. To you know, low to low moderate um, taxpayers and hundreds of volunteers each year. Um, it is core to PMP's mission to assist Minnesota taxpayers with filing an accurate tax return and claiming the correct um, tax benefits and credits that they are eligible for. Um, I and my staff are greatly appreci uh, appreciate the simplification and expansion of the renters' credit. Uh, my primary reason for testifying today is to support the simplifying calculations for the renter's credit. This would be more beneficial to our taxpayers at Prepare and Prosper supports 
Um, I speak for the majority of our taxpayers when I say I'm extremely supportive of the change in definition of household income to more uh, closely aligned with the tax filers uh, address, uh, adjusted gross income, the AGI. Uh, the consistency of using the AGI will greatly decrease the confusion of how the credit is calculated, uh, increase accuracy of return preparation, and minimize any tax return follow-up required by the Department of Revenue. Also adding this credit onto the state income tax return will deliver the renter's credit filers um, earlier in the year with a more predictable timeline than the summer distribution of the current uh, refund right now. Um, shifting the renter's credit to the income tax return also removes the administrative bar barriers to the filers face when preparing their own tax return. Uh, when when re you know, require, in requesting the renter's credit. Uh, many tax software vendors require renters to print and mail the M1PR um, and many times are charged to print them out and send them in. Um, this extra step can cause taxpayers to miss out the credit because they didn't know the form was needed or needed to be mailed or cause taxpayers without easy access to printing, you know, printing out and claiming the credit. P PMP has um, surveyed um, our customers over the past few weeks, and we have learned that over um, that overwhelmingly um, majority would like the renter's credit being combined with the state return, and would prefer to receive the renter the renter's credit earlier in the year. Copies of the survey um, are available, um, and you can see the sampling of our custom the customer survey um, that has been provided to you as well. Um, thank you again, the community, for um, the opportunity to testify today. Well, thank you so much. Uh, is there anyone else that would like to testify for or against this? Okay, seeing none, member questions, Representative Hollins. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. I just want to express my gratitude um, to Representative Coulter for carrying this bill, and I want to give my personal experience with it. So when I was in law school, I got scholarships to cover my law school payment um, and I worked at a coffee shop I would open at a caribou every morning so that I could afford like my cost of living which wasn't a lot because I would only work like two or three hours in the morning before going to class um, and I filed for the renter's credit not knowing that my scholarships counted as part of my income and so immediately you know like two years after I got out of law school I got these notices being like, you need to pay us all that money back that you got because you had income. And I was like, I really didn't have income. It, you know, it was a grant that went from the federal government to the school. I never saw any of it, but they were like, that counts as your income, doesn't matter. You are not qualified for this. And so um, it was, you know, it doesn't seem like a lot, but it was kind of a heavy penalty as I was like just coming out of law school and having to pay back thousands of dollars. Um, and so I really appreciate looking at this in like a more realistic way <laughs> because, um, you know, my household income did not reflect what I was actually receiving. And so that adjusted gross income would make a, a lot more sense. So I appreciate you bringing this and I fully support it. Thank you. Anyone else? Representative Anderson. Thank you, Mr. Chair and to the, to the bill author. Yeah, this is a good idea, but uh, just have to ask why you wouldn't have also applied this to folks that own their homes. Uh, you mentioned that uh, residential property taxpayers are being hit with a 17% increase. And the, the timing, um, folks get their property tax statements early in the year, March, April, and that first half is due in May. So this uh, would have really applied well to them as well. So just wondering if it could be expanded to include the homeowners as well. Representative Coulter. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and, and thank you, Representative, for the an excellent question. And, and the original proposal that, that then Representative Marquardt, <coughs> excuse me, then Representative Marquardt Carey did include um, that as well. That I, you know, I mean, obviously that expands the cost of the bill, certainly. Um, certainly open to that discussion, I think, as we move forward. Um, I don't want to speak for the chair, but I'm, I'm sure there'd be a willingness to, to hear a similar bill targeted at homeowners as well. I, I think it certainly makes sense. I think, um, <coughs> excuse me, for myself, um, as I will get into here, 
Um, you know, for me, the, the particular focus, like I said, was focusing on, on renters, folks who that we know are, generally speaking, lower income, um, folks who are, are more likely to sort of be on, on the, the tail ends of the, the age spectrum, younger folks and old, older folks. Um, so that was kind of my focus with the bill, but I, you know, certainly am open to the discussion about expanding it to, to homeowners as well. Representative Anderson. Thanks again, Mr. Chair. Well, um, except for the one time uh, fiscal year change and when the, the money would go out, um, and there may be a few more people that would, would get it, like with the renter's credit that hadn't gotten it previously, but I don't think it would be a huge increase in cost uh, to the state except for the one time juggling to the next fiscal year. So, um, yeah, I'd, I'd really like to work the on that and then look at it. Thank you. Um, I'm going to go to uh, Ms. Schill. I think she can uh, shed some light on the cost. Ms. Schill. Uh, Mr. Chair, Representative Anderson and members, um, I happen to have the revenue estimate from uh, Representative Marquardt's bill from last year. So these are older numbers, but um, as Representative Coulter said, his bill contained both the repeal and the shift um, for the Homestead Credit State Refund and renters. So to add homeowners to this proposal, the first year one-time impact is just under $1.2 billion. And then that would continue going forward and slightly increasing. And the repeal component is about 650 million. So if you do the math, it's roughly 650 million and growing as the net cost to adding homeowners. Okay, uh, you're good? All right, Representative uh, O'Driscoll. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I don't know if the mics are on on this side today. Are they? Okay. Um, Representative Coulter, I have a question for you about um, how to deal with kind of a, uh, a transition glitch in your bill. And that is sometimes in a fiscal year, people may be a homeowner and they may also be a renter. How do you anticipate reconciling that um, in, your, in your bill? Um, because you would file for both of those at the same time under the current law. How would that um, be able to be resolved in providing paperwork in a timely fashion for, for both parties? Representative Coulter, would you like uh, nonpartisan to answer that? Um, I can take a stab at okay. it. Okay, go ahead, take a stab. Nonpartisan staff probably would, would get a better stab at it, let's put it that way. <laughs> Mr. Williams. Uh, Chair Lisa Lagarde and uh, Representative O'Driscoll, my understanding of how it would work is that presumably you'd file for your renter's credit as part of your income tax form, so it would probably be a standalone credit form on your income taxes, and then if you're also a homeowner, you'd file a kind of a traditional M1 PR property tax refund form separately. So you'd probably have to file separate forms um, under current law. And as, as you're probably aware, they're kind of administered on the same form. So you might have an extra piece of paper to file if you're in both those situations, I think, under the bill. Representative O'Driscoll. That um, sheds the light on it that I needed, Mr. Chair. Okay, any other discussion? Representative Kwam. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and I was sort of uh, uh, surprised with the comments that uh, um, you know the the rental thing impacts uh, seniors and disabled uh, you know much more you know frankly what I'm hearing from my community and across the state are seniors are you know they work their whole life to get a home and now they're retired have lower income and they're paying rent to the government for their home in property taxes. And that, uh, um, you know, they would be surprised and shocked that this bill uh, dropped them out because that, frankly, if I, if I look at the, uh, all the new revenue uh, reports from the time of the bill you, you mentioned, that had, you know, homeowners included in, in this and that, I think we've uh, steadily had more and more and more and more and more surplus. In fact, some of those times, you know, a, put a couple of those together, you've probably got the magnitude of what the cost is. But so even though we got a greater surplus, we can no longer afford 
the uh, fine proposal of our former representative. Um, so we got more money, but we can't give. Uh, we don't understand that seniors and disabled also sometimes are homeowners. In, in fact, they're, that's why we have a lot of the code things to, to get accessibility and help out. I see projects in my district and many communities of where we've got volunteer groups that if somebody um, had a car accident or for some reason uh, has a dis disability that the neighbors come out and build that ramp, help convert that home to be more accessible so they can stay at home the home that they built, that they've lived in, instead of going to an apartment or a long-term care facility. And I think, if I remember some of the discussions with the, the former rep that had the bill that this took part of that bill, um, it really is better for people to facilitate being independent and living in their homes to make it more affordable for them to stay in their homes. And, you know, just like it's hard when they can't drive anymore, but when they can no longer sleep in their own beds. And part of the intent of the original bill was allow them to do that. Um, so I, I guess I'm, I'm really surprised that uh, uh, we've got more money, a lot more money, but now we can't afford to do this. All right, thank you. So uh, any closing comments, uh, Representative Coulter? Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I would like to just quickly respond. I don't believe I ever said we uh. couldn't afford to include homeowners in the bill. Um, I Closing comments. Yeah, all right. I. I yeah, I'll, I will move on from that. So um, I guess, you know, just in, in closing, the reason that I took this bill on originally, to be frank, is because I, I just get frustrated at the idea that we have these kinds of barriers in place. Renters essentially pay property taxes automatically. It's just included in their rent. But in order to get their refund, and again, this is money that we have said in law that we are in, that they, that these folks are entitled to, we make them take take multiple extra steps, even more if their landlord isn't proactive on their CRP. I won't use the term that I normally do because we're in polite company, uh, but frankly, I think that's silly. The larger point, though, is that we've heard a lot of talk this session about how best to get money back in Minnesotans' pockets and particularly about helping folks who make less money in seniors. We are, I think everyone in this committee is focused on where we can do the most good this year. And I'm certainly not going to pretend that this is not a significant investment, but I think it's one that I would be hard pressed to find anyone who would say it's a bad one. Well, thank you, uh, Representative Coulter. Representative Coulter renews his motion that House File 1653, as amended, be laid over for possible inclusion in the Property Tax Division report. It's laid over.